Hi everyone, and welcome back to the Hockey Journey Podcast. Episode number 124, The Reed Simpson Hockey Journey. Presented to you by OnlineHockeyTraining.com. I'm your host, Coach Lance Pedlick. If you're new here, please make sure you subscribe so you won't miss out on any future episodes. Before we swing our partner round and round, hockey style, and begin this conversation, if you want to learn more about me, my hockey experiences, that I have the world's largest database of off-ice stick handling, passing, and hockey shooting drills, what I know, and most importantly, how I've been helping hockey players get really good with a stick and puck, just head on over to OnlineHockeyTraining.com, that's OnlineHockeyTraining.com, and gain instant access to my 10-part video series where I'll show you everything. Consider it my gift to you. Lastly, if you live in Minnesota or are visiting the state of hockey sometime soon, and want to schedule an in-person off-ice stick skills lesson, I'd love to have the opportunity to show you my little world. Go to SweetHockeyCoach.com, that's SweetHockeyCoach.com, and watch the video on the homepage for instructions. Thanks, and I look forward to working with you sometime soon. Ladies and gentlemen, hockey enthusiasts and fans of the game, welcome to another exciting episode of the Hockey Journey Podcast. Today, we are honored to have a true warrior of the ice with us here today. Our guest is a former NHLer, a former teammate of mine, whose career was marked by grit, tenacity, and an unwavering commitment to his teammates as a protector. Hailing from Flin Flon, Manitoba, he made a name for himself not only for his skill with the puck, but also for his fearless role as an enforcer. Throughout his journey in the National Hockey League, he proudly donned the jerseys of several iconic teams, including the Chicago Blackhawks, Tampa Bay Lightning, St. Louis Blues, and Montreal Canadiens. Known for his physical style of play, this forward left an indelible mark on the game and earned the respect of fans and foes alike. Get ready to hear firsthand about the battles on the ice, the camaraderie in the locker room, and the memorable moments that shaped his hockey career. Without further ado, Let's lace up our skates and dive into the incredible hockey journey of the one and only Reed Simpson. Simmer, welcome to the Hockey Journey Podcast. Hey, how are you guys? How are you doing there uh, up in Minnesota? Uh, I'm doing fantastic. And man, it's been, I mean, we played together in the early 90s, didn't we? And Hershey and we haven't seen each other since. <laughs> yeah, it's been a long road, man. Um, I remember... Uh, Coming in there my first year, I was like, I came from Flin Flon, Manitoba, which is probably about 15, 16 hours north of Minneapolis there. And I, I'd never really been to the United States, at least on a hockey, hockey thing before, other than a little bit I played in Western Hockey League. And it seemed so far away, but uh, the Flyers were so welcoming for all the players that they'd brought in those years. And there was, you know, all the young guys we had on our team, um, and all the way stretched up to the older guys like, uh, you know, Tim Tukey and, and Don Biggs and Mike Stuthers and guys that have been around for 10, 15 years in the minors at that point. Yeah. So it was, it was a pretty cool, uh, it was a pretty cool little town to live in. I think, as you remember for coming, you know, for your first year at, at the pro level, I, I can't imagine being in a in a town like Chicago playing for the wolves. If I had to at that time, right. so it, was a, it was, it was a great, great, great place <clears throat> to start. And, uh, I really enjoyed, uh, the, the teammates and the fans that we had there. It couldn't have been more supportive. Yeah. Well, just settle down. You're, you're riding on a airplane right now. I need you to get on a scooter and slow things down. So <laughs> if, if you don't mind simmer, uh, what I like to do with all the guests that come on the show is for you to take a few minutes and let's just rewind the tape and go back to the beginning where you grew up. Because what I, I get a lot of, you know, I get in front of a lot of players that um, want to accomplish or have big lofty goals. And, you know, I like to have people tell their journey to, to help this next generation uh, be a little more prepared so they don't have to go through maybe some of the the pain and discomfort that uh, we all go through when we play hockey, but you can't eliminate it, but maybe you can minimize it. But let's, uh, where'd you grow up? Uh, you mentioned that, but what was your childhood like? Your parents, your brothers, sisters, friends, your introduction to hockey and other sports? Basically, give the listeners a glimpse, a little tiny peek of what it was like growing up Reed Simpson. Well, 
you know, I grew up, I guess, thankfully, in, 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 in some ways, if you're considering the hockey side of it, but I grew up in a small town in northern Manitoba that, you know, sports and being outside and, and being involved in your community was, was a big part of everybody's life. And um, hockey was a big part of, of, you know, every boy and girls kind of growing up. And what we did was, uh, you know, we played, we played hockey in the winter and baseball in the summer. And so we, I, I felt like my whole life that when, you know, when I played hockey, I, I, I you know, I was never one of the better players in my community. I, I was always one of the actually kind of the B players, but it, it, it drove me to, to work harder every, every year and work, you know, work smarter and, and try to get, try to get to the next level every year. And, and the way they worked it where I grew up, they would have like a, a, a two year system. So if you were nine, you'd play with the 10 year olds. So you were always kind of a year behind and you'd get to play with the better players. And then the next year you kind of were the better players. So I, I always tell kids that are playing now, like, you know, you don't always want to be the best player on your team. Um, cause you want to have something to work for, but you don't always want to be, you don't want to be the best player either because, um, you know, you don't want to be the worst player I, I, either because then you never kind of, you never kind of, you never kind of move up. So there's always a little bit of a carrot to, to chase. And then when you get there, you want to be able to get all the ice time and hopefully get to, you know, learn the things that you learn as, as, you know, the guy that plays the most. So, um, that's how my journey was. And, and kind of luckily, I guess you can say, again, we had a junior team in our town that nobody really wanted to come all the way up to Flin Flon. And it was kind of known as a tough town. So, um, it was hard to get players to come play there. And, and, um, there was a lot of, of, of good hockey players. Bobby Clark had come from Flin Flon. Reggie Leach had come from Flin Flon and, and uh, a lot of the junior players had graduated and played professional hockey. So there was also a, a reality that you knew that if you, you know, there was people that kind of emulate that, that made it uh, before you kind of the next generation um, you were. So I, I just took it like, you know, play and have fun and work hard. And, and our teams in, you know, Pee Wee and Bantam always did well in the provincials. And we saw that there was a place to kind of move up to. And our, our junior team, you know, like I said, wasn't able to get players to come there. So when I was 15 years old, I was being asked by, and I don't know if you remember this guy, Mel Pearson, he was a, his, his son was actually a, a coach at, at Michigan tech and Michigan at the time. And, and um, his dad was the coach of the Flim Flon team. So his, his, uh, they asked me to come in and, and play. And I, I was like, you know, the young kid, but I had a big stature and, and they, uh, they kind of put me in with the 20 year olds and I got my ass beat quite a bit, but I learned how to take a, you know, play the physical side of the game and, and, and kind of take it. And that, that just allowed me to kind of move to the next level. So I grew up really quick from the time I was 15, 16, and I ended up going and playing hockey in the Western hockey league at six, at uh, 16 with Patty Janelle out in New Westminster. And uh, that, I wasn't quite ready for that at that point. But at 17, I went to Prince Albert. And it was, you know, it was kind of a perfect match. Um, they had a they had a coach there named Terry Simpson, who who was had just graduated. And um, they they he had went to the NHL and they were looking for kind of a new 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 people. Rick Wilson take, had taken over with a with a guy named Peter Anhold, who's still now, you know, is running running um, teams in the Western Hockey League. So, you know, I, I was around a lot of successful people as a as a young kid playing hockey, and it, it showed me that you know you were able to kind of move up. And when I got to Prince Albert, um, there's already three or four first round draft picks on the team. Um, Mike Madano had come there that year. Um, so it, it just kept kind of rolling. And, and once I played there for four years, I, I realized that I was kind of the next guy that was able to maybe make the jump to professional hockey after I got drafted. And, uh, Bobby Clark was still actually in Philadelphia when I got drafted by the, by the flyers and, you know, that kind of paved the way. And, and, you know, you know, kind of the rest of the story 
I played one year there. Well, hold on, hold on. Let's let's again. You're just on such a fast track. I mean, I just rock it at a medium pace. I'm a little different now. Okay. <laughs> Um, There's a lot to get over here, I guess. <laughs> well, I, I'm just I'm curious of the the younger, you know, your Bantam years, because you you couldn't fight then. When oh, you I, could, <laughs> I, you could at that time. Okay, yep. so it, it was different, but you know, and, and I, I want to remind everyone of what time period we're in. We were in a period of time where the NHL they had uh, designated fighters, tough guys that were on that team and you were in that era. So uh, I look at when you're your your third and fourth year when you're playing for Prince Albert, uh, the Raiders, I mean you were you were a point of game guy, but when did you decide that I'm gonna add this fighting element and uh, this I'm gonna see how far I can ride this wave. You know, I don't think I decided. I think the game decided for me, you know, like I uh I, like I said, growing up in Flim Flon, it was a tough town and, and there was games in junior where, you know, you'd look down the bench, there'd be five guys left on the bench. And, and if you didn't, <laughs> if you didn't engage in that, um, you got shamed at school, you got shamed in the coffee shops that you went into, you got shamed at, uh, you know, at the rink. Like if you didn't stick up for yourself, at least stick up for yourself, let alone your own teammates, um, you just didn't make it. Your teammates wouldn't didn't respect you, and and so I I I just I just took that as like this is this is what you do in hockey. This is how you play the game. Um, you you win by if you by the scoreboard, and you win by you know over being being a tougher 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 team than the other team, and that's that's just how it worked for us. So so I I continued to do that as a as a 15 year old, like I said, I took a lot of beatings and I had a coach one time in junior that used to make us pair up at the end of practice and say, you know, all right, you got to keep fighting each other until, until one guy says uncle. And I remember coming home one day from, <laughs> from practice and, and I never gave up, you know, I, 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 I'd fight 20 year old guys. And I remember came home from practice one time and I took my shirt off and my mom saw all these bites on my back and she just started like looking like started laughing at me like what 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 do you guys do there like and and I just said I just said to her like listen I'm not giving up I'm not going to ever give up to anyone and 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 that's how it kind of started and I and luckily I was good at it and as a as a 15 16 year old kid I I learned how to learned how to play like you know use that as part of my game and I got to Prince Albert and I you know I was a kind of an unknown there and the first 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 skate i got in i got into two fights and did really good against uh you know kind of like the hometown tough guys and and from there they i kind of earned my my respect a little bit and we had guys on our team like darren kimball and and dave manson and ken baumgartner and oh and guys that had gone on to like you know being crazy tough nhl hockey players before me so i I just kind of kept that role in, in my pocket and, and realized that, you know, you're skating down the ice and, and, you know, after you just beat up someone on the other team, like you, you, you tend to get a little bit more room. The guys kind of pretend hit you instead of really hit you. <laughs> you're standing in front of the net and guys are kind of talking to you nicely instead of like telling you how big of a, you know, how big of a, a, a pussy you are. So like I, I just use that as, as part of like how I was going to play the game. And, and really when, when Mike came in, you know, he was the, he was a golden boy of, uh, of, of Prince Albert at the time. And everybody, everybody knew what a special player he was. And he was even introduced to it a little bit, but you know, the guys in the team kind of said to him, like, listen, you do what you do and we'll make sure that, that you never have to, to pay the price for it but so we stuck for him and and i learned you know he taught us how to play the game game of hockey and i was lucky enough to play on his line for a couple years into into the draft and and obviously every scout in the planet was coming to prince albert to see that so it just kind of i I gotta admit he 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 helped he helped me in the draft draft situation because all the scouts were there and you realize that the game is like uh is is 
is you know is a really hard game, but he makes it a hell of a lot easier to play when when you're when you're playing with a guy like him. So I just I knew that that there was tons of great hockey players out there. And and I said to myself, like, listen, I'm willing to do anything I have to do to 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 separate myself and be a better, you know, to add something to the to the team that that other guys either can't or aren't willing to do that that I can, you know, kind of keep my keep my spot on the team when I know guys are better than me. And it'll give me a chance to to improve. It'll give me a chance to, you know, stay at the level that I'm at and, and go to the next level. And if I continue to do that, maybe there'll be, you know, another opportunity as as you stick it out. And and if we're talking about, you know, advice I give to to younger kids, you know, hockey's a, you know, there's a it's a multi-dimensional game and there's, you know, even as a scout now that I, you know, at the, at the national hockey league level, I watch, you know, I watch NHL games and minor league games all the time. And you, you know, if you're talking to young kids and even, even young pros, you know, everybody can skate and everybody can shoot and everybody can, everybody can play the game. And there's, there's thousands of kids out there that can do that, but it's the, it's the little things and it's the willingness to, to, you know, to play physical and the willillingness to to do other things that other guys just won't do and 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 put block yourself shots. in tough, block shots, tough, tough you know? situations, block shots, you know, make simple plays, not try to confuse things too much. just just stay in your lane, but but be there every day being the hardest working player on your team and to be a you know to be something that 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 can add value to a team every every game and not every game you get a chance to score a goal and things that like you know that you'd want to do i mean everybody wants to go out there and score goals and everybody wants to go out there and and you know create opportunities to to you know to produce points but it, you know there's there's other parts of the game that become really important that you you have to do in order to to make to make it to the next level and the 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 reality is that that you know, there's only six guys in the that, that play in the top six and on an NHL hockey team. And there's only six guys that play in the top six on on any team at any given time most of the time. So, if you want to be part of a team, there's you know you have to figure out a way that you can you can be part of part of a team and get ice time and 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 contribute in in a way. So, you know that's that's what I figured out from a young age. I think that gave me the opportunity to 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 stay at the levels that I were and to stick around long enough and be around you know the better players because that's that's how you get better is 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 be around the best players and and emulate them and and slowly but surely you become one of the better players at that level yeah absolutely yeah. and it, what I am curious I mean you talk I, I call it doing the extras you're talking about a willingness to you know, do what other players that aren't willing to do on a daily basis. And you and I were very similar. You know, we were, we weren't, we were the, the healthy scratch or the, the guy that's in and, you know, you, you get maybe a few shifts a game and you got to make an impact on there. But what did you do growing up prior to getting drafted? Um, what were your extras? I mean, did you, were you working on your stick skills at home? Were you a pond hockey rank rat guy? Uh, did you have a, a trainer that helped you on the ice with skills, uh, working out and stuff? Talk about some of your your mentors or people that guided you during that period. Well, like I said, I was I was I was around. I lived in a hockey town, um, similar to probably like a lot of you know Minnesota hockey towns where you know hockey is the big thing on Friday, Saturday nights. There's games and the whole town is there and everybody knows everybody knows everybody. And, and it's kind of like the, you know, the Texas football thing. And, yeah. and so like, I, I, I had a ring like right next to my house growing up. My, my parents weren't really into hockey, but the neighborhood was. So my dad, my dad hooked up a light from and plugged it into our, into our house, you know, ran a 300 foot cord out there and it's minus 40 out, but the whole neighborhood would be over. So we just practiced out there all the time and 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 then in the summer we played road hockey in front of my house so I, I remember when I was growing up when they finally paved the road in front of our house 
the whole like everybody everybody thought that was the greatest thing because now we could actually play road hockey on yeah. cement and not have to play on you know dirt roads. So it was <laughs> it was it was it was just a kind of an environment that everybody played. And like I said, there was, I was never the best player. There's probably 25 guys that I grew up with in my age group. There were, they're all better hockey players than me that, that I don't know, maybe that was a blessing for me that I wasn't the best because I had to work and I had to, I had to kind of do the extras. And I remember there was just stuff like, like I just I I just said okay like if if I'm gonna walk uptown I may as well jog uptown it was like a three mile jog to get uptown instead of like thumbing every once in a while I just say you know what I'm gonna run and I'm gonna test myself and and just push myself a little bit harder and I think every kid can see that what everybody else is doing and if you're honest with yourself you you can look around and say like am I working harder than everybody else or am I just kind of Am I just putting my time in? And 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 I I I always had this competitiveness with me that that I wanted to be, you know, the best. And and I don't think you can just you 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 have to kind of have that in you. And and you have to that's a like I don't know if it's a if it's an innate thing or it's a learned thing, but you have to want to be you have to want to be the best, and you have to want to you know be better than you are you know, your former self, I guess you could say yeah, yeah. every kind of day. And, 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 you, you know, I didn't, I didn't really compare myself to others. I just kept saying to myself, like, you know, how can I be better? How can I be better? And then it, and you, you'd realize that you're getting better and you, you know, I didn't measure my, myself with, with points and, and stuff like that. Cause I actually, I quit hockey when I was like organized hockey when I was nine years old and because I just wasn't that good. And, and I wasn't a great skater and I came back when I was 10 and, and I, I just, something happened. I played a lot outside in the, in the rinks and, and I, I just said, you know, I, I just want to keep doing this. And if you, if you really, really give it your best and you want to do it, you'll, you'll find ways. And, and I, you know, we lived in nature, so I'd set up little, little, uh, um, you know, courses that I'd run through. And, and then I went to a hockey school. I remember when I was like 12 years old in Winnipeg where I had never been put through this fitness kind of thing. Like just doing, just doing 30 pushups for me at that point was like, was like, I thought it was the hardest thing in the world. So yeah. by the time the summer was over, instead of want, just wanting to do 30, I, I, I ended up being able to do 50, I think, you know, so I always kind of pushed myself to just say, I want to do a little bit more. And I think you remember, Lance, like even at the pro level, when we'd get sat out, we'd be the last guys out on the ice taking shots. And, you know, the coaches would sometimes have to come out and kick us off. And again, we'd have, you know, guys like Mike Eves were there and he'd always want to do the, he'd ask us to do the extras and we'd always be the guys in there saying, all right, what more can we do kind of thing instead of, yeah. you know, and we always know those guys that, that were like, kind of sneaking out of the gym early if they had they do the mandatory stuff but they'd never really do the the extra stuff and and if you if you adopt those those kind of things over time you 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 separate yourself and you and you keep testing yourself to go to the next level and that goes for skill stuff that goes for that goes for um you know physical fitness training that was another thing that i realized um at the pro level another way that I could separate myself was to be in better shape than everyone else. And I think when you and I were coming in, we, you know, physical fitness was probably not anywhere near the, you know, the level that it is right now. Like if, if, if a, if a true athlete was, you know, a hundred percent, you know, most pro athletes in hockey were probably around 80%. And, you know, and, Olympic athletes were at, you know, 99% kind of thing, you know what I mean? A hundred percent. And I saw that and I'm like, well, no one's really training here. Like, like Olympic athletes, you know, like, like I thought we were like Olympic athletes to train because you'd see these guys in the Olympics and they'd prepare for four years to train. And, and we thought like a summer was like a long training process. So 
I took that as, you know, maybe you got to train all year in order to like really be an athlete. I remember coming back to Hershey um, one year after I had been to Minnesota and Mike Eves had recommended I go see this uh, guy named John Frapier up in in um, Fargo who had vented this uh, these skating treadmills. And then again, I learned like, wow, like this is what, this is what it, it feels like to be in, in great shape. And I came back to camp and I was like, holy mackerel. I'm like, I'm flying by guys. I didn't get in. I didn't do much more as far as the hockey thing, but I, I got to be much of a better skater and I got to, I, 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 I just became a better hockey player. So I realized that all these things put together would make me a better hockey player. You know, you can, you can stand there and take a thousand shots on net and you can stand there and like stick handle through a million courses. Um, but if you can't get to the net and you can't get, you know, you don't have the physical fitness to, to kind of play the game for, for a minute and other guys are getting tired at, you know, 35 seconds, you, you, you've extended your ability to play the game. So every little aspect matters. And, and now the details even are more minute because every player that comes into the league is at that, is at the 95 to hundred percent level, you know? So you can't just separate yourself physically anymore. You got to be able to say, look at the game and say, like, again, what do you do? What, what can I do that, that other guys aren't willing to do? Whether that's not make a mistake in, in critical areas of the ice, whether that's like, you know, figure out like, you know, um, how to be a better defensive player because that matters kind of thing. So, yeah. Uh, I want to tell everyone, um, uh, Reed, he lives in uh, downtown Chicago in some high rise, and he's got uh, some construction going on there. So you might hear that. In the yeah, background. I'm sure you guys can hear it. I'm sorry he, about that. No, yeah, and you you brought it right up. So I just want to let our listeners know that you're not only really tough, but you're caring. You think about the listeners too. So thank you. <laughs> uh, I, uh, you know, Mike Eves, he he was the perfect coach uh, for me. My first year pro. I think it was your second year there, maybe, um, because I don't know if you remember, but we'd have our work days where we, you know, we'd have our practice, get bag skated, and then we'd go in to the to the you know change, and half the team would go in and have a, a workout, uh, ride the bike, and the other half would go in and go to the skills room, and that's where we, I learned how to juggle. I mean, he had a, anything you yeah. could juggle, you had in there. You had a ping pong table and stuff like that. Do you remember that? Because those are yeah aspects. no I, I I remember those 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 things fondly because I remember a lot of people used to make fun of it and 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 I you know I was everyone like, I was like of, yes I was like yes this is awesome yeah like I I kind of embraced it you know and and it, it I could see where the comedy was a little bit you know I I I could understand why there's a lot of guys thought it was kind of funny. And, 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 but it, it made, it made a heck of a lot of sense to me. You know, if you could be a, if you could be better coordinated, you, you could be, you're going to, it's going to translate onto the ice. And as I was saying earlier, I played a lot of baseball growing up and luckily we, we had a, we had a really good baseball team that, that I played with growing up too. So we went to a lot of national championships and I, I felt like that baseball was, you know, the hand-eye coordination of, of being able to hit a ball or just being able to run and catch a ball and, and learn those skills and, and then learn how to be competitive at a, you know, at a, at that level, you know, was, was, was a great thing. So all those little things that the bands that we had to run behind and the parachute stuff that, you know, was getting introduced at that time. And, and just all that stuff was like, was just to me, really interesting i remember like like when i'd get sat out sometimes i would i would and probably no one knows this but i would i'd go jogging on the out out, out around hershey park all those games i'd get get um scratched and no i'd wear my underwear out there and i'd run down the i'd run down the highway and i'd see all the people coming into the rink but it was my kind of release of of like of like, I come out for warm up, and I remember if you remember Hilly, 
he would he'd stand at the end of the hallway and you'd you'd be like kind of walking down there and if he was standing you'd i'd force him sometimes to to wait there all the warm up he'd be the last guy to come out because i knew i was getting scratched and he'd be standing there and he'd just look at me and and be like kind of shake his head and not say anything and because I knew he felt bad, yeah. But I get my I get my underwear on and I'd run outside down the highway and I'd see all the cars kind of filing in, and it was my way of kind of like, of like just releasing the like the, the the pissed offness that I had. I think sometimes of of not being able to get to play that night, and I'd come back to the rink and the game would be started and I'd finish my twenty or thirty minute run, and and I it made me feel like all right, I've done my thing kind of thing. I, I played my game before the game even started kind of thing. So um, it was all those things were, were, were little techniques that I used to kind of motivate myself to kind of stay, you know, stay involved as much as I can. And, and Mike was a big part of it. Like I said, the ping pong thing got really competitive um, over the years. Like guys were, you know, we'd have the championships and everything like that. And oh yeah. It was it was fun. It was a fun thing to to be around and and thankfully we had a lot of good good guys around and everybody kind of supported each other. But you know, it, it definitely helped me, you know, being involved in those groups of, of guys that wanted to want to kind of get better every day. Yeah. Oh. People, do I bring the right guests on this show? Yeah, I do. This guy's mm-hmm. awesome, isn't he? Uh, I wish that our paths would have crossed uh, more. So, um, this thank you. These are all of this great. We could talk about Mike Eves um, all <laughs> the rest of the I show. I still see Mike once in a while. He's he's he worked for Cleveland over the last three or four like uh, prior to the last two or three years. So he he he's been um, he's been involved in the scouting. I think with Columbus now for for the last couple of years. So I still run into him. We still. We still laugh and joke about some of the things that happened. I remember, I remember we used to play three on three after all the time, and and uh, he'd get he'd get he'd get just as involved in the in the games as as we would. And every once in a while, he'd get he'd get a hit a little harder than he that than he thought he was supposed to. So he'd get he'd get pretty competitive himself <laughs> out there. So I you know yeah. it was great to have guys like him as mentors and at the pro level. And like I said, I had had Rick Wilson as my coach in junior, and and that guy coached, you know, in the NHL for probably thirty years after after he coached me in junior. Uh, Terry Simpson's another guy that I was around. Um, I went to, you know, went to Albany after um, after, and, and Robbie Fatorik was a coach there. I had Jacques Lemaire as a coach in the NHL. I had uh, Joel Quenville in St. Louis. I mean, the list goes on. Barry Trotz in in um, in Nashville, the, like there's just there's just legendary people of the game that that I was able to kind of be around over my careers and 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 just and take all this from that 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 helped me along my way. And I and I tell everybody this, like you know, take as much as you can from everyone because everybody 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 has an angle and everybody has, has a different view of things, but, but just, you know, learn as much as you possibly can and, and don't slough anyone off because everybody has some kind of something to give you, you know, and, 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 and they're, everybody's really in the, in, in the end, really just trying to help you along the way. Coaches aren't trying to, trying to take things away from you. If you're, if you're giving your honest effort. No. And I, I agree. Um, Though a lot of these situations stink, uh, yes. they're hard to go through, but it is part of the game. And at the end of the day, the coaches have to make decisions and someone's not going to be happy every single game. Um, yes. So uh, I love that story about you that when you were a scratch, that you would go jogging and just see the people filing in. in. Uh, I was up in the press box already eating chink- chicken fingers and chocolate chip cookies, but <laughs> <laughs> so I remember. I remember the be- the biggest, the the best, one of my favorite memories of you, Lance. Um, you you pulled your groin one time, and I'd never really pulled my groin before, probably because I didn't have enough muscle in my legs to pull anything. But um, 
you came in <laughs> after you'd pulled your groin and 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 we're like what is a pull i, I never really kind of knew what that was because you know it never really happened to me and and then the next day you came in and you took your pants off and i was just like we sat across from each other and you literally had like a bruise from your knee all the way up to your like your waist and i was like <laughs> what the heck? what the heck is going on there's like it looked like someone like had like taken a bat and beat your leg for about Isn't half that crazy? an hour. Yeah. And and I was like, this is the craziest thing I've ever I've ever seen. And and I was like, it was like it looked so painful that that I was like, I don't know if this guy's ever gonna be able to play again for Christ's sake. <laughs> so that was oh. one of the that was the one thing that I remember that'll never I'll never forget when I saw that that injury that you had. Yeah, no, I had, uh, unfortunately, that was part of my deal. Um, I'm sure you had plenty, but most of your injuries were due from fights. Uh, huh. But let's, let me, let me just set this up for everyone. All right, so you played uh, in Prince Albert for the Raiders for four years, a year with uh, new Westminster Bruins, a year before yeah, that. Yeah, that was a short stint. That was when I was, that was when I was 16 years old and, Couple games, you weren't ready. Yep. I wasn't mm. ready at 16. I like I, I wanted to be ready. I thought I was ready, and then I just wasn't, you know. Yeah. Like, and they sent me down to a tier two team in Abbotsford and 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 I was just like, well, I can I can live at home and play at the same level as this. So I went home and ended up yep. going to Prince Albert after that. Yeah. So you turned pro. Um Started out with Philadelphia, played in Hershey, Pennsylvania. And for those of you who don't know, Hershey, Pennsylvania is where they make Hershey chocolate. And there's a, I probably should do a solo episode just on uh, Milton Hershey, just the, yeah. the great human being that he he was for, uh, he was an orphan and he uh, used a lot of that money to help uh, other orphans have a great life. But you started out in Philadelphia. Uh, then... You you were there for three or four years. Then we got the the Minnesota North Stars, the Kalamazoo Wings, the Albany River Rats. So then you go from Minnesota to New Jersey. Uh, you got Chicago Blackhawks, Tampa Bay Lightning, Cleveland Lumberjacks, St. Louis Blues, Montreal Canadiens, Milwaukee Admirals, Nashville Predators. I'm not even done yet, people. Uh, yeah. Pittsburgh Penguins. Wilkesbury Scranton, I was just there a few weeks ago, the Rockford Ice, Hog, uh, Ice Hogs, and then you spent two years in Russia and then came back and tried to give it a go uh, with Chicago, but then it ended. So, uh, man, uh, you traveled a lot and have a lot of suitcases. What I'd like to uh, hear, we talked a little bit about Hershey, but you played one, your first game in the NHL with the Philadelphia Flyers. Yeah. Talk about how awesome that experience was and then just, you know, how you found out and you're preparing for it and then you experiencing your first NHL game for the first time. Well, it was that that's kind of like it's not the traditional like it's not traditional cuz like to, if I'm if I'm being really honest like the way it happened for me was um I, I don't know if you remember in the 92 year, I think it was my third year playing in the minors. There was a bit of a strike and it was a two or three week strike. And Hershey was already in the playoffs and Philadelphia, when they came back from the strike, they, they had to finish their last three or four games of the season to kind of get the season over with. And I wasn't playing in the playoffs for Hershey so they called me up to the NHL to, to, to play. So all the other guys in the team were like, why is he getting called up? Like, he's not even playing here. So so I get called up to play, and I'm like, well, I, you know, regardless of why or what, this is my first NHL game. And it was against Hartford, and there was 5,000 people there, and it was kind of like a no game. So no one was really taking it seriously, so... I got to play a little bit and I, I, you know, I thought it was great and everything like that. And, um, but it didn't feel like a, like I'd earned it. You know what I mean? I knew deep down inside that I wasn't, I wasn't like, it was just kind of by luck and, and again, great. But, but the next year I went to fill, uh, signed with Minnesota and I got called up and played with, 
I was in Minnesota. I was practicing. I was there for probably about two or three weeks. I never got into a game, and I was really, damn, I really wish it was. I got sent back and and then um, um, sent back to Kalamazoo. And then by chance, they were playing the Blackhawks in, in Chicago, and I was in Kalamazoo, which is a two-and-a-half-hour ride. They called me, and, and I, I, you know, they said you got to you're getting called up to play tonight so i had to get the guy at the rink that ran the zamboni to drive me from kalamazoo to chicago in my car and stay i I was staying at the drake hotel so i got called up i stayed that night practiced with the team and and we went into chicago and i don't know if you remember how this started but it was right after the, the you know they had started doing the claps in 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 the stadium so i i go out there for warm up and i'm looking around and there's like Stu Grimson and Brian Marchment and a bunch of guys that you know i knew were were real tough guys and, and i'm like i'm going to fight one of these guys tonight for sure like i want to fight <laughs> one of these guys so and i had been doing really well at the minor league level i kind of went through the whole league and and knew that i was tough enough so um They start the anthem, though, and and I'm like, everyone starts clapping. I'd never even heard or seen this before. And Mike Madonna was a good friend of mine because we played junior, like I said. And he's standing next to me, and I'm looking. I'm like, what is everyone doing? And the crowd just went bananas, and you couldn't even talk. So by the time the anthem was over, I had pumped myself up to the point that I was like, I couldn't wait to get out there and, like, just run someone and, (laughs) and, 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 you know, start something going. So that's what I did my first shift. I was lucky. The puck went to the net. I went right to the went to the net and hit someone and got in my first NHL fight and and did really good and and the whole place was going bananas. I think after that there was a there was a brawl in the stands across from us where there was probably <laughs> 30 40 people fighting each other and it was just one of those nights where when the game was over um I was like okay this is what an NHL game is. And I remember, you know, they, I got sent back down after the game, but I just remember saying to myself, like, this is what I want to be involved in if I'm going to play hockey, uh, you know, for, for, you know, this is the type of, of, of game and the atmosphere and, and what I want to be involved with. And it kind of set the bar for me to, to like something to, to feed, you know, to go for it. and ended up that year. And I never really knew what happened, and it kind of, <coughs> excuse me, plagued yep. me for uh, three or four years. But I had that year, I, I, I'd gotten a sports hernia, and I never really knew what it was, and it, it and it kind of kept bothering me. So I, I kind of went through an injury phase there for a year or two, where it kind of came in and out, in and out, in and out, and I got traded to Albany, and. And it was still bothering me all the time. I was working out, but I never really knew what it was. But I fought through it for a couple of years, and finally, finally, in uh, in in you know, I kept my kind of eye on the ball, and and I I had a chance again. You know, I felt like a rebirth in in Albany that I was going to get a chance to play in the NHL again. So that was where I I you know I refocused again and said, okay, this is my chance to play in the NHL again. When I got traded to uh, to the uh, to the New Jersey Devils. So I I just had an interview uh, a couple weeks ago with a former teammate of yours, Chris McAlpine. Yep. And he was telling a story. It was his first training camp in New Jersey, and I don't know if it was the coach or the GM Lou Lamarillo Lamarillo coming in there speaking to everyone before camp started, just saying that listen. And this is Chris talking, you know, um, saying that uh, you were instructed that, hey, we want to have a good camp, show us your skills. We don't want to have any fighting, guys, no fighting. And he, he says, I'm in my first camp. I go out there, and the first shift, this guy, Reed Simpson, starts fighting someone. <laughs> you know? And I'm like, what are we, you know, who am I supposed to believe? So, uh, but that's, you, you were at that point that uh you got a taste you wanted it and you know i had the same advice from a guy uh he was one of my coaches at the university of minnesota bill butters and he was a real tough guy uh back in the day 
played for the Minnesota Fighting Saints. I mean, slap shot, that's, that's a lot of him. Um, but he just said, listen, you know, there's all kinds of ways to get there, but one way to get anyone's attention is, you know, to, to pick fights and to, you know, back up your teammates and stuff. And he says, you know, you don't have to do it your whole career, but if you do do it, um, you can maybe get a foot in the door and, you know, put together an NHL career. And I did that one year. I didn't fight a ton, but I fought probably a dozen times, 10 times maybe that one year where I was up and down. And then I finally yep. stuck. And that's what I, when I heard that story, that's, it just reminded me of me that in that spot that you were like, screw this, my foot's in the door. I don't want to leave this. And it looked like you, you know, New Jersey, you still spent uh, uh, some time in the minors, but you established yourself as someone that could play in the NHL on a regular basis. Well, and, and I was lucky, like, like, like you said, um, I had established myself that I could do that. And I knew that like, at that point, I knew that all the guys that I had played with, whether or not it was in junior and the, like, it was like Tony Twist and Kelly Chase and oh, and uh, Jim McKenzie and and, and guys like <laughs> yeah, all the guys that played like that that were my age group. I had fought and done well against either one or, or, you know, you'd won one, you'd meet, you know, you'd lose one, you'd tie one, you'd whatever, but they were all the top level guys that could do that. And I had, I had, I had, I had done well against all those guys. And I, I honestly, at that point in my career, and I, I think I always felt this, but like, and I'd say this, I, I could say this to myself. I went into every single fight believing I was going to win like I, I really did and and I don't remember I never was one of those guys that sat at home wondering or worried about it it would whatever happened happened like but I really I didn't I went into things believing I was going to win and you know that 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 included playing the game you know what I mean and I I think that mindset really kind of helped and I again you knew the guys that you were fighting um, they believed they were going to win too. And you knew the difference between guys that were like in it to win or in it to just survive. And, and, and I was in it to win it. And, and that's the kind of mentality I think you have to have, whether you're fighting or you're fighting for a puck in a corner or you're fighting for position in front of the net. And guys know that, like, you know, that, you know, there's guys that, that, that when they come, when they come to take their space, they're you, they're not they're not screwing around like they're like gonna take it and if you if you push back they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna just gonna there's gonna be an ultimate like decision I'm gonna fight this guy then if 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 I if you're not gonna if you're if you're gonna push back we're gonna have to fight about it and so that's that was my mentality when I got into fights and and luckily I. Uh, you know, there was a lockout that year again, you know, maybe another you know, twist of events for me, but the minor leagues, my, my second year in Albany, um, there was no other hockey. So we were, we were the biggest show in town for, for that time. So, so we got to play till January and I was, you know, first line player in Albany. I was scoring and we were winning and we had a, we had a team that was in first place. So I got called up as soon as the, as soon as the lockout was over in January, no one was in shape, so I got called up. I got to play my nine games before I got to ten, and I got sent down in March at the trade deadline, and and I got to, you know, I got to, I got to experience playing in the NHL as a real player, and and I knew I could play at that point. Like I was contributing, I was, I was, you know, I I was a factor in every game. I probably had three or four fights in nine games, and I was winning those fights, and so I, I felt very comfortable at that level. And then we won the we won the Calder Cup. That was a that was a huge high. Then I got called up and we we won the Stanley Cup. And I I didn't get to play, but you know I was I was part of it. We were practicing every day with the team and 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 I just you know I I I said to myself again, you know, we I just won the Stanley Cup. I'm standing on the ice. I didn't have my equipment on, and and my thought was, the next time this happens, I want to have my skates on. You know, and and. 
and I want to have been playing. So that was my next goal at that point in 95 was, was always, I want to win a Stanley cup when I'm actually playing in, in, and I remember standing there like holding the cup and all the crowds cheering and I've got my suit on back then. They didn't put their, your gear on or anything like that. And I was just like, man, like I really want to have my, I really want to have my skates on next time when this happens. And it was my goal. It never happened again. Came close with St. Louis, but but I, I I just remember that was like the biggest thing that I could, you know, that I could remember, and that 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 I wanted to chase. And yeah, and I'm kind of getting back to what you said before a little bit about the fighting. And I and and you know, as a as a as an NHL scout, a pro scout, like there's an opportunity now for for players, and I can I, I'm speaking more to to, you know, high level juniors or anyone that's kind of trying to move up in a level or even, even minor league pro guys, I go to probably a hundred American hockey league games every year. And, you know, fighting's virtually out of the league. It, it happens, but you know, this, it's not, it's not something that you have to do anymore. You know, if you get in one or two a year, because you know, you're, you're kind of out of emotion or something that happens during the game. Fine. But it's not a it's not a thing that that I, you know, I believe that is even fully needed all the time. Like I think I see a lot of fights now that are that are kind of like, okay, what's the point of this kind of thing? Someone got hit and now you got to fight. But you know, that's not that's not the, what I'm talking about as far as you know fighting. Like the opportunity now is for kids, uh, and like I said, I see a lot of the minor league games. Just be physical and just be. Like if you want to, if you want to get yourself noticed, like, like we were talking about back in the day, just run through every check, you know, like finish every check, be the first on the puck and, and take a hit and keep your feet moving through it because that's what scouts will see. And that's what, that's what, that's what people that want players on their team will see is that people that are willing to pay the price in tough areas of the ice that other guys won't because Surprisingly enough, like there's a lot of players that won't that won't do that, and and a lot of good players that won't do that, and 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 that's that's something that that separates players over and over and over again, in you know in, in getting to the next level. It's it's I always used to tell. I remember I told Tony Amante this, like 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 the he he'd say to me after a fight sometimes because I sat next to him in the dressing room, he'd be like. Geez, man, I, I don't know how you do it. Like you got the hardest job in hockey. He'd look at me in Proby and and uh and I, I said to him one time, I go, you know what, Tony, I go, you got a hell of a lot harder job than me because scoring goals at the NHL level is really, really hard. Like, like if you like it's easy to get into a fight. Like it's not it's not so easy to score a goal. And and you know, and, and he started laughing and I and I'm like, you know, it kind of rings true. Like if you want to just, if everybody can, everybody can take a hit and give a hit. It's, that's not a hard thing to do. That's just a mental barrier that you got to get over. And, you know, scoring goals is tough. So then there's only so many guys that can do it at, 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 at that high level at, at, at any level. So you want to separate yourself and be, a, and, and become more valuable than the guy sitting next to you or the, you know, the rest of the players in the league, like, Give a hit and take a hit and just and take that punishment because what you realize is it's not as hard as you as you actually think. And and you yourself, Lance, were were one of the better hitters in the league. And and and, and so you know, like when you get a guy's you can get the angle on a guy, all you and you go through him, like there's nothing there's nothing better, like not a better feeling than when you really just clean a guy up and and you know when he comes back again on you that he's hesitant to, to, you know, to go to those areas. So, so that's, that's something that, that I would, I tell kids all the time, you know? So here's, here's what I, my response would be because, um, and I don't even know if you coached along the way youth hockey, but yes, I yeah, had a I 17 year coaching career and, uh, and then have many, many players that, uh, including my boys that uh, have played college or professional. And this, you know, you talking about us playing physical, me, you want to, you know, my advice was you want to get 
in the NHL as an everyday player, go fight, do something that others aren't willing to do. But what happens when you're a skill guy, you know, and you're you're not getting the opportunity like you did as a younger player, a college player, whatever, um, and you've never done that. All you know is how to do is to score goals, and now, you know, you're – a fork in the road has come where, you know, do I want to do this path? Because I, I remember, you remember Craig Fisher? Yes. We play with him. I just remember him as being so flipping skilled, but yeah. he just couldn't get over the fact that he wasn't the number one guy in Hershey right out of the gates. And he, yeah. he couldn't, he couldn't adapt. Uh, and I, I have no idea if he went on to play a bunch of NHL games, but I don't, uh, he played right. in Europe for quite a while after that. And I mean, and, I, and that's, that's the answer that I would give people is like, you know, and I used to say that, like, I used to think that at least anyways, like when guys would say like, well, that's just not my game. And I'm like, well, I guess your game's not going to be in the NHL then. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's just the reality of it because, you know, you could, there's, there's, the the minor leagues are littered littered with like the American Hockey League's littered with with skilled guys from whatever place they came from, you know, before that never make it in the NHL. And 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 I can tell you this with with a thousand percent assurity, you know, there's probably anywhere from three to to fifteen NHL scouts at every minor league hockey league, every AHL hockey game. And every single one of them is going to say the same thing. Like, 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 show me a player that's going to like, that separates himself, that wants to play physical and that player will get to the NHL. Like they all say it. And if you're a skilled player coming from whatever level you, you came from, if you're not willing to like, to like morph and change your game into like what a third, fourth line player plays like, then you're probably not going to play in the NHL because you think you're a first line player at the American Hockey League. You're probably not a first line or second line player at the NHL level. And so, where do you think you're going to play? Like, where is your spot on the team? And it's going to be most likely. And and you know, I just did a, I just did a kind of an evaluation of like eighth to fifteen, fifteenth picks in the NHL first round draft picks and I looked at like what this is an exercise I did for myself but you know where do these guys end up and what what types of players do these guys end up being you know and the reality is even like 8th to 15th round first overall picks usually end up as like if you get one of those guys to be a third line player and you get and he gets 30 to 40 points a year you probably hit a good you probably hit a good number on on that. You know, not a lot of players even that are drafted in the first round become top 6 NHL hockey players. And that's just the reality of it like or top 2 defensemen in the league because a most teams don't even have like top 2 defensemen in their league. Like if you you want to call legitimate top 2 defensemen like there's probably 10 or 12 NHL hockey teams that don't even have one on their team. So like, how do you, how do you, how do you become, you know, an NHL defenseman that contributes? How do you become like an NHL forward that contributes onto a team? Like, are you going to be a top six? Are you going to be a a Boldy coming out of college? Are you going to be a, a, you know, a Bedard coming out of junior? Are you going to be a, like, where are you going to fit in? Are you going to be a Reichel? You know, like in in Chicago right now, playing in the top two lines, like m- maybe not. And you know, so you got to figure out how to play third line type of hockey that 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 a team can use because you'll stick around for a long time. There's there's lots of guys that played 600 to 1,000 games in the NHL playing third line hockey that made 20 to 30 million dollars a year. So yeah. there's nothing wrong with that. You know what I mean? Like. Like, yeah, if you get the opportunity and you're, you're lucky enough that you, you, you know, you get slotted in there once in a while and you prove you can do it, great. But, like, it's not – it's a very rare, rare thing that, that it happens, you know. And, you know, 
there's not a lot of Kaprizovs that come along, you know, very often. There's probably only 10 in the league right now at yeah. this level. And there probably won't be more than 10 at some point, any more point in time. So, you know, you got to be one of those players that, 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 that figures out a way to contribute. And that's, that's what I did. And I, I, I owned a junior hockey team for six years here in the Chicago area. It was in the, 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 M, the, uh, um, it was in the Minnesota junior hockey league for a couple years. Then it was in, in the, uh, in the, in the league that plays across the country, kind of like the North American junior hockey league. And, and I told all the kids the same thing. I said, listen, you work hard, you, you do what you have to do to, to you know, to contribute and, and you'll get someone at the next level will want you. And I was always able to get kids graduated in the division three colleges from there and get like half their school paid for if they worked at their schooling. So there's a place for, for kids in hockey everywhere if you if you if you put your mind to it yeah and i you know i i uh i train more girls now than i do boys uh-huh. and uh for the you know they get frustrated because they they have the mentality of you you know mm-hmm. how you went through your career and they want to play after college and mm-hmm. there's not a lot of opportunity after that uh now you know you got that uh professional league um but man, you've had a journey, and we still got like ten years of your professional career uh, yeah. <laughs> to, to talk about. So we're not well, gonna we're not gonna get all of that going right now. But I uh, I guess I just let's let's just quickly transition into um, how did it end? We know that you're a battler, a scrapper. Uh, you're the guy that just won't go away, and it, the proof is in the pudding, and how long you played and um, just the, the, the individual that you are, you're not going to get the amount of uh, opportunities that you got unless you have all the, the virtues and, uh, you know, daily disciplines uh, in, integrated into your, to your life. So um, how did it come to, the, to an end for you where, where hockey was done for you as a player? Well, for me, like, you know, I, I exhausted, I, I remember the 2005 lockout again. I'm, you know, I, I, my, my, my career was bookended by like lockouts. So the 05, 04, 05 lockout came and I was living here in Chicago and I, I thought I was done. I, I knew there was like, there was going to be no hockey that year. And I kind of held out. I was looking at maybe coaching. That's what I wanted to do. I'd played in Nashville and, and David Poyle had asked me about coaching a couple times while I was playing there and, and hinted at he wanted to hire me. And and I, I thought I had some time. I thought I had some playing year left, and that's why I signed in Pittsburgh. I got hurt in, in Pittsburgh. They sent me down. I got hurt when I got to Wilkes-Barre. They, I, so I ended up staying there the whole year, and that was kind of it for me. Um, I knew it was come to an end, you know, my playing career. If I didn't play – during that lockout, I was going to be 35 years old and I wasn't going to get a contract. I didn't think so to make it quick story short, I was going into coaching. I was like, I'd had an interview with the Islanders and I got a call from, from a friend who, who had a contract for me in Russia. And I was like, he told me how much money I was going to make playing in Russia. And I was like, are you kidding me? Like, that's, that, that's more than I made in the NHL. So like, I was like, Let's do it. Let's try it. So I went to Russia. I, you know, I could talk. That's going to be a whole nother podcast. But like uh, that was back before the KHL was even there. So I went there. I did that. I, you know, I like they, I loved playing there. I, I, I was one of those guys that they treated me like Wayne Gretzky, that country did. And, and I, I did what I did in the NHL. I fought. I, it, was, it was something new for for Russian hockey, I don't think they'd ever seen anything like oh, that. Man. Let me just in, let me just tell everyone: you played two years there in Russia. You yeah. you put together just over five hundred penalty minutes in two years. So yeah, yeah they love you. <laughs> they, it was it was it was like it was like something they'd never seen before. And and you know the the team I played for, we were known for that. And that's what that's what our owner wanted. And you know, he treated me like a son. I, he, you know, 
everything was first class. I got taken care of better than anyone you could ever imagine. You know, it was still Russia. I and I when I went there, I I you know I made it a point to learn Russian. I I learned Russian within probably three to four months. So I was able to communicate. I was able to spend time with with people alone speaking Russian. And I loved it. And they and like I said, they were they were fair to me. They were they treated me good. And I got paid on time, just like like, you know, they have these horror stories about guys not getting paid, but I was working for the right guys and they took care of me. So that came to an end my my two years. And then, you know, the owners asked me, they're like, Do you do you want to be the assistant GM? And I was like, Sure, why not? Like there's another mountain to climb. So <laughs> so they needed they needed a guy to kind of do scouting and and find the find the players that that the import players. So I helped them get Chris Chris Simon and Brian Berard came over and Darcy Verreau came and we had a good group of quality NHL players that you know were not not only just tough but like they could play the game kind of thing. So I did that for a couple of years and you know, basically when, you know, I got, the, I got the five players that we were, we were, we were supposed to get, you know, my job was done. So like, I just was there helping, helping at practice sometimes and this and that. And I, you know, four years in Russia, that was enough for me. So I came back home and my job was kind of done. And I, I you know, I, I kind of said to myself, I'm going to stay, I'm, I'm just going to take a step back from hockey and like, you know, January, I get a phone call from Wendell Young in Chicago Wolves, and and he he asked me, and I'm skiing out in Calgary, and he's like, "Hey Reed, do you think you still play hockey?" And I'm like, "Wendell, like, I'm, you know, I'm 40, right?" And he's like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." And he's like, "And I, Wendell, you know, I'm I haven't played in two and a half years, right?" And he's like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, just come out and skate with us." So Chris Chelios had been playing for them at the time. He was trying to, you know, he was trying to play one more year and he was trying I think he was trying to play with his son so he wanted to keep going too and and he was 48 at the time so I'm like well I'm 40 so I can still do this so I came back and I, you know I put the skates on I was probably 25 pounds overweight for my real hockey weight at the time and I p- practiced for my first time and I thought I was gonna have a heart attack but I stuck <laughs> it out and and I worked my way in and did yoga for like an hour hour and a half a day in the morning, an hour, half at night before I went to bed. And after two weeks, I think I lost 20 pounds and I was ready to play. So I finished off the year there and it was probably the funnest, like three months of hockey that I played. We went to the semifinals and, and, you know, there was no pressure. I probably got in five or six fights in 20 games and still did pretty good. And, and I, I just was like, this is it, you know, like, I have nothing to prove. I knew that that was it. And and people always ask me, like, they're like, you know, how'd you know it was over? And I'm like, well, I never really retired. I just stopped getting contracts. So <laughs> that's really, that's really how most careers end. I think, you know, I didn't have a press conference to, to announce it to anyone. I, I just, I just kind of rode off into the, into the sun and, and that was it. And I, and I, and, not many guys get to do what I do and get to, you know, get to go out on their, I guess it's your own terms. My son was old enough at the time then to get to actually see me play. He was probably nine years old at the time. So that was fun for me to have him come to games and, and watch me play. Cause he'd never really seen me play, you know, professional, you know, at that point. So there was a lot of things that I, you know, I, I really was fortunate enough to do, in my hockey career and that, and, 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 you know, you, you kind of re- reiterated to it earlier, like, you know, for girls hockey, there's never been a time, you know, that's been more opportunistic for young girls to play, you know, hockey. Like I'm, I'm lucky I got to, you know, do those things. And, you know, there's, there's opportunities everywhere for everyone. If you put your hard work in, you know, just to come from, you know, minor hockey and junior hockey for girls to go to college and get, get it paid for and then have an opportunity to play at the next level. That's kind of how I felt at that point was like, this is my, this is my send off kind of to, to play my last year pro. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. 
Um, we are over an hour now, and I we could probably, I mean, I could crack a bottle of wine, and we're going for yeah. another three. Um, yeah. What uh, What do you got going on now in your life, Reed? Well, I, I've lived here in Chicago um, pretty much since that 05 we were talking about. You know, I, I moved back here to Chicago. I, uh, I, you know, I spent those years in Russia, but it was during the winter. And I've, I've, I'm, I'm really lucky the, the again, and I took full advantage of this because the guys here are so great. The Chicago Blackhawk alumni has, has been one of the, you know, the, the best alumni that, that, that NHL teams have had over the years. So I was able to integrate myself into that and meet guys that had retired before me and, and kind of paved the way and a, and a, and a, you know, showed you the road to, you know, what life after hockey's like. I've, I've made some great friends. Like I said, Chris Chelios is one of my better friends and you can't meet a more, uh, you know, you know, giving and, and thoughtful person, you know, and someone that it gives to hockey more than Chris has done in his whole life. So, you know, he's been someone I've looked up to my whole life and, you know, so we get to have a lot of fun here and the opportunity to, to go to, to go to baseball games and concerts and be on the lake in the summertime is, you know, this city is, is great. So, you know, when I get my time off in the summer, I'm currently working for the Montreal Canadians. I've been there for now seven years as a professional scout. You know, we've, I've been fortunate enough to go to the, the, the Stanley cup finals, you know, with them three years ago. And, you know, we're kind of in a rebuilding phase now and, and we're getting to the point where it's getting exciting where our team is is starting to get competitive, where I think we're, you know, we're, we're, we got a couple more pieces to add here where we're going to be, you know, a team that could challenge for a playoff spot. And, and as you know, now when you get into that group of teams that are, that are in the playoff spot, you know, anything can happen if you're playing at the right, right level. So, you know, it, it's exciting. I, you know, I, I still go to probably 150 to 100 and, 60 NHL and minor league hockey games a year. So, you know, I'm still involved in hockey a lot. I still get to, I get to, I get to be in Montreal three or four times a year and get to meet the players and, and hopefully have an impact on, on their journeys to, you know, to getting to the NHL and staying in the NHL and, 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 you know, being a part in, in, of what, you know, I was a, a part of for the better part of uh, 20 years of my life. <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy. Man, golden nugget after golden nugget. Simmer, uh, first, I want to thank you for taking the time and being on the Hockey Journey podcast. Second, I want to congratulate you on a great NHL career that uh, I was grateful to be part of that journey, not in the NHL, but when uh, when we were scrapping and clawing and biting to do whatever we can. Yeah. Uh, you did it, man. You played 301 games in the NHL and earned every one of them. Uh, and you you have probably way more games in the minors. So, I mean, you did it. Uh, well, la- you know, the funny thing is, like, I, I, I always laugh because I think I have more healthy scratches than I do actual games in the NHL. So <laughs> me too. <laughs> I, I got I, I got to I got to uh, I got to watch a lot of free NHL hockey before I did it for a living. Um, and, you know, we used to make jokes about it. I remember Kevin Dean, uh, and we'll wrap this up real quick, but we went on a road trip with uh, with New Jersey one time. I think we sat out five hockey games in a row, healthy scratches in the Western League, and we started talking about, like, you know, fan experiences, and, and we got, we were like the, we like won the lottery because we got to, we got to practice with the NHL team in the morning. We got to have pregame dinner, and we actually got to stay at the same hotel with the team, and we got a free ticket to every game when we were on the road and, and we took it like, you know, as an opportunity and as, as to just be part of it and, and give our, give what we could have every day. And, and, you know, I was lucky that I grew up, you know, my first NHL experience was with the New Jersey Devils. Cause we had, we had quite a group there, you know, with Billy Garen and, and uh, all those guys that, yeah. that treat us. So Brian Ralston and, and, you know, guys like that, that, that were, were my good friends Scott Niedermeyer and Ken Danico, and the list goes on with the players that we had that were 
Neil Broughton that were that were just so so cool to be around. So, you know, I'm 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 real fortunate, and I I I thank thank my lucky stars every day for that. Yeah, I mean it's uh, it's been a journey. Well, um, say so, so tell your son I I'll be looking for him over at the uh, United Center. I'd love to meet him and say hi to him again. Yeah, I'll do that. So, um, thanks for still being in the game and passing on your knowledge and experiences to the next wave of hockey hopefuls. Um, if there's any way that I can help you and what you got going on, let me know. But it's been just fantastic uh, reconnecting with you. I appreciate you, my friend, and all the best. Thanks a lot, man. Well, that concludes another episode of the Hockey Journey podcast. I can't thank you enough for stopping by and listening. I hope you enjoyed hearing Reed Simpson's Hockey Journey, and boy, was it not an easy one. One last thing, if you think there's someone interested in your circle of family and friends that might like this episode as well, please share it with just one person. It would really help me in growing this hockey community. Again, I appreciate you being here. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, or submit a review. I hope to see you back here soon, and do me a favor, make someone close to you smile today. All the best, my friends.